There was a woman who went to a lawyer because she wanted to get a divorce, and the lawyer got out his notepad and proceeded to ask her some important questions, and he said, do you have any grounds? And she said, oh, yes, I got about three-quarters of an acre. <laughs> and the lawyer paused for a moment, <laughs> scratching his head. Uh, he says, well, do you have a grudge? And she says, she says, no, but we do have a lovely carport. <laughs> Again, the lawyer paused and asked, does he beat you up? And she says, no, I get up before he does every morning. <laughs> and finally, finally, out of frustration, the lawyer blurted out, lady, why don't you just tell me why you want to divorce your husband? And she says, well, because that man can't carry on any kind of an intelligent conversation. Well, we're looking at uh, the role of men and women here uh, today and husbands and wives in these verses that we're looking at and also what we're going to be seeing, Lord willing, next week as we've split this up into, into two parts, looking at the part about the, the wife today and then looking at the part about the husband next time. And we want to trust God so that we have proper understanding of these verses as we look at it. And obviously, all of us, if not us personally, but people that we know, have been affected by marriage problems in our society and divorces and all kinds of things like that, where families get split apart and even those who are staying together are having problems in their marriages. And it is so common in our world today, and it is so very, very sad. But one of the things that we can do is we can look to God's word for help and for guidance in these things so that we can be pleasing to God in as best a way that we can. It is true that the most common type of counseling that pastors deal with is marriage counseling, and that is because people have all of these different problems that are going on in their lives. Most of the time, people have problems in their marriages. It's because they have chosen to do things in a way that is not the way that God has designed things to be. And so as we begin this morning, we're looking at uh, this wonderful book in the Bible, 1 Peter, where, we, where it was read in chapter 3, and we want to recognize just what it is that we are reading, because we are not just reading something that some man has written and something that's someone's opinion or something like that. What we are reading is the holy, inspired, written word of God, and we don't just read it and try to apply it to our lives because it's our preference or because we just have some kind of, uh, some kind of tradition that we want to be following. No, that's not what this is about. This is about God. God giving us revelation to us about how he wants us to live our lives and what pleases him. And what we need to do today and every day of our lives is surrender our will to his. We need to think the way God thinks by reading his word. Now, this portion of scripture is very applicable to people's lives. It is applicable directly to, to wives, but it's also applicable to other people as well, I believe. I believe that this can even be helpful for, for husbands because, first of all, husbands need to know what God's will is for their lives. Uh, husbands need to give their wives support and to give them room and freedom to be able to do what God has called wives to do. But this can also uh, be helpful for those who are single and maybe not married, never been married before. Because when we look at this, this tells us something about how, again, this is God's revealed will. And I remember thinking back to passages like this whenever I was single, before I got married to my wife, and I looked at these passages and I thought to myself, well, on the one hand, it seems like this doesn't really apply to me. But on the other hand, I think I can learn a lot from this still. And one of the reasons that we can learn from this as single people is because you might get married someday. And if that's the case, then you need to know about these things. And also, this is helpful because this teaches us some things sometimes in these passages about husbands and wives in the Bible, about the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church, which is spoken of as being like a marriage relationship. Now, in, in 1 Peter, we have been seeing in previous weeks how we are supposed to be uh, submitting to certain uh, groups of people in different situations in our life. So we are being instructed that we will, first of all, be submissive to governments that we saw in verses 11 through 17. We saw how we're supposed to be submissive to masters in verses 18 through 25 of chapter 2. And that was uh, talking about, we talked about how that can apply to our uh, employer-employee relationships that we see today. And so now we are seeing how they're supposed to be su uh, the submission of the wives to the husbands in verses chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. 
So looking at this, this is something that's hard for us to understand. First of all, that's the first problem whenever people have issues with passages like this, is most of the time they've misunderstood what it's talking about. And they have some kind of extreme interpretation or extreme take on the issue. And so they have, they have twisted it in that way, and therefore they cast it aside or don't want to apply it to their lives. So what we want to do is we want to understand it properly, first of all. And then once we understand it, we want to apply it to our lives. Now, that is very difficult with topics like this if, if we are not a Christian. If we are a person who has never been born again, if we don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, then we're going to have a real problem with the Bible passage today. And I imagine a real problem with the sermon today. But if you have been born again, and if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you have a relationship with him. And maybe to a greater to a lesser degree, depending on your measure of sanctification, you have the ability to look at this passage, to see its value, and to have a desire to please God through this passage. We ought to live differently after we're saved than what we did before we were saved. And the question for this morning is, how should I live differently based on this passage? Chapter 3, verse 1, it tells us, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. We have this word likewise in the beginning of chapter 3. So again, this is, this is connecting us with what has been talked about in the end of chapter 2 where there's submission to, those, to the government and to masters and now it's submission to husbands. And so it's continuing in the same context. This is the next group of people that are supposed to be submissive and it's talking about wives. It's saying be submissive to your own husbands. So when we see this word, be submissive, it is the same word that we've already seen. When you go back for a moment to chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. That word submit is the Greek word hupatasso. It means to submit uh, to something. Chapter 2, also in verse 18, it says, servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear. That word, again, is the Greek word hupatasso. And then here in chapter 3, verse 1, it says, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. That word submissive, again, is the word hupatasso. Now, what is this? What is it talking about? And we want to be careful here. It is a voluntary step on the part of a humble Christian wife who wants to do what is best for her marriage in the sight of the Lord. So we want to look at this. We want to say, okay, well, am I a Christian? If I'm a wife and I'm a Christian, then I want to do what's pleasing to God. I want to see what is in God's word. And even if it's difficult, even if, I'm res even if it seems strange at first, I need to ask the Lord to help me to apply this to my life. Uh, the one commentary that I looked at suggests using the term in a way that we can understand in our culture, uh, respond. So you want to be responsive to your husband in a way that is healthy and in a way that is good. You want to give support to him. You want to listen to him. And you and um, it is good for a Christian wife to allow her husband, even if he's unsaved, to be the head of the household. Now, there are a lot of women who struggle with this, and there are a lot of people in general that struggle with this, but I believe that God gives us instruction in this section of the book, specifically because it are things that we struggle with, and specifically because many a times people are not practicing these things. We are going to see that next week, Lord willing, when we talk about husbands and the kinds of things that husbands are being instructed to do, I believe are often very common things that husbands just aren't doing. I think that's why God gives those kinds of instructions. And so one of the reasons that I believe we are given this instruction for wives to be submissive is because many wives are not, are not that way. Many wives are wanting to lord it over their husbands, and many wives want to be independent, totally independent, uh, in a way that they don't need help from anybody. And that is a problem when we are looking at this passage. Now, I understand because of the world we're living in today and because of our culture that people do not want to accept this, that people don't like this. It is not popular, um, but we, we, there's nothing, no way to get around that. When we're going through verse, verse by verse through books of the Bible and you come to a passage like this, I am not going to just skip over it. We need to look at it and see what is it that God is trying to tell us here. And there are many passages in the Bible that are like this, where if we were to skip over every passage that's controversial in our day, well, how often would we have to skip over something? You know, I believe that's why many churches are just doing topical sermons randomly throughout, uh, throughout the year. They're just 
preaching whatever they're picking for whatever reason. And one of the reasons they do that is because it's easy to skip over passages like this. But that would be a shame because that would be to miss out a part of the whole counsel of God, I believe. Now, I believe in something that's called complementarianism, which means that God has designed men and women in such a way that we have different roles in our relationships. We are different. We are not made the same. We can tell that just plainly by looking at each other physically. We see how there's differences in how God created us, but God also created us differently in terms of the way we think and in terms of the way we use our emotions and how our emotions affect us and different things. And there's nothing wrong with that. We can be thanking God for that. We can, we can praise God for our differences. And because we are different, and if we recognize those differences, we ought to be able to help each other through life. As husbands and wives, we ought to be able to complement each other so that we have strengths. And so there are many people who will not accept what is said here, but we as Christians must listen to God's word. There are liberals out there, liberal Christians you might call them, but I believe that most of them, they aren't even, they aren't even Christians because m- liberal Christians deny, the, deny all kinds of core doctrines of the Christian faith. But one of the things that they do is they try to explain away this passage. There's all kinds of different ways people try to explain away a passage like this. One of the things people say is that Peter spoke only through the culture of his day and that ours is different and that makes this no longer relevant. That's what a lot of people say. Well, a lot of other people say that Peter is morally wrong in what he says, and therefore we shouldn't obey it. But the problem with that is people are setting themselves up as judges against God and judges on God's word rather than allowing it to instruct us. And when Peter writes here, we need to know that he is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And that makes this not just Peter's word, that makes it God's word. And we cannot stand in judgment of what God says. But what we must do is we must look at this as something which God has given to us and which God has instructed, which transcends all peoples and all cultures and all times. If we, if we properly understand this passage, we first must understand it properly. Now, some people would say that this instruction for wives to be submissive to their husbands is harsh because it leads men to be abusive to women. Well, that may be true in many cases, and there are men out there who take advantage of their wives and who do not treat them right, and this is horrible, this is disgusting, this is ungodly, and we have to say it's sin whenever men do this. There are some people out there who try to make it out like the Bible allows for such things to be the case and that that is okay, and that is obviously false. Now, this verse, we have to recognize is speaking to the wives. It is not speaking to the husbands. I want you to notice that. It says, wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important because if men were to miss that point and think that, well, they might think they have the freedom, you see, to go to their wives and to make her obey, to bring her into submission. And hopefully, as I say those words, you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable with such a thought. Uh, There's something that is not right about that. No. Uh, What we have here is for the wife. So what is she supposed to do? She's supposed to consider what God wants for her and to carefully apply it to her life. One of the things we need to understand about this that is helpful about this submission is that it is a spiritual kind of submission. That is what is at the foundation of what is being talked about here. It is talking about a spiritual kind of authority. So we want to think, for example, by way of illustration about spiritual authority within the Godhead. We believe in a God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are three, yet they are one. That is difficult for us to understand, but that's what the Bible teaches. And there is a spiritual authority in place between those persons of the Trinity, such that the Father has authority over the Son, and, over, and the Son has authority over the Holy Spirit. And so we, need, we can look at that and recognize that there is no lack of worth in any member of the Trinity. There is, there is not one that is more God than the other, nothing like that. But there is a certain kind of submission and authority that takes place between the members of the Godhead. And so in the similar way, there is a spiritual authority in place that, that, that is there between wives and husbands. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 talks about this where it says, but I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ 
is God. There we're plainly told about how uh, Jesus Christ is over the man and that the man then is over the woman. And so there is, again, this spiritual kind of authority. So I believe that uh, the man, the husband, is supposed to be the spiritual head of the household. He is. He is supposed to be the leader in his home. He is, the, he is also supposed to serve in leadership roles in the church. And we need to understand that. There are many men who have, who have given up trying to do that. They feel that they just... They're just comfortable being lazy, I guess. And because of that, women have found it easy to just lord it over their husbands. And that is something that I have to tell you is against God's plan for marriage. As difficult as it is to grasp and as hard as it is for us to apply in our culture, this is a, that is against the will of God. Now, we also need to understand when it says for wives to be submissive to their husbands, it is not saying that the husband gets to use her like a doormat. That's one of the things that many people say. They use that as an expression in opposition to what this is saying in this passage. They say, well, you're trying to say that the wife is like a doormat. Well, no, that is not what we are trying to say because the wife is not inferior to the man in, in any way such as intellectually or in terms of their worth before God. That is not the case. Uh, God can save men just as well as women. God can use men men just as well as women. It is just that he has designed things so it is so that we have different roles in life. So the husband doesn't get to just tell the wife what to do all the time and she has to always obey. Now, uh, it is my opinion that that would be sinful abuse of the husband's spiritual authority. He needs to consider his wife. He needs to listen to her. He needs to ask her opinion. He needs to think about what she likes and, and help her with her spiritual journey. And instead of having kind of a negative relationship that many people try to portray Christians who believe the Bible as, as having. Now, each family unit is different, but generally speaking, husbands and wives should make decisions together. And the, the primary way in which the submission needs to be understood is in terms of spiritual kind of submission. Now, thinking about marriage relationships and husbands and wives, men and women, obviously, like I said, we are different. We think differently. Our emotions affect us differently. Women oftentimes like to talk a lot. <laughs> and men sometimes just want to sit in silence. Sometimes I talk to my wife after she gets off of work and, and she wants to tell me about her day and I want to listen about her day. And I'm, and I'm thinking, well, maybe five minutes is good. And about 30 minutes later, you know, uh, there's more and more details coming and and, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm really trying hard to, I want to listen, I want to listen. It's just a lot of detail, but uh, men and women are just different. That's just the way it is. And sometimes that's okay, but we do need to consider the kinds of differences that we have. We need to look, men need to look at their wives and think, okay, well, how can I, how can I please her? How can I consider her needs? And then the wife needs to do the same thing for her husband. How can I care for his needs? How can I respect him? Dave Barry says, this is a quote, quote, Think how much happier women would be if instead of endlessly fretting about what males in their lives are thinking, they could relax, secure in the knowledge that the correct answer is very little. <laughs> Men sometimes don't think very well. But communication, you see, is very important in a marriage relationship. We do want to be communicating as much as we can and as clearly as we can. Now, we have this instruction to wives. If you're looking forward for a moment to verse 7 of chapter 3, where it talks about instruction to husbands, and what it says there in the beginning of verse 7 is husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding. So you see, this is a hard thing in verse 1 for, for the wives to put into practice, but there's also difficult things in verse 7 for the men to put into practice, and there's even more there that we're not going to read uh, this morning for the sake of time. And so the men are supposed to be understanding with their wives, and that is helpful as, as we go to understand what this is supposed to look like between the husband and the wife. It is, not to be, it is not that the husband is supposed to be in any way abusive or in any way negative towards his wife because of this submission. He is supposed to be understanding towards her, and we'll consider that more next week. Timothy Keller wrote a book called The Meaning of Marriage, and he had a chapter in his book on the submission of the wife to the husband. And I loved in that book, written by Timothy Keller, that he had his wife write the chapter on the wife's submission to the husband. I love that. When I was reading that book, I thought it was, it was excellent. And so she was talking about how the relationship between the husband and the wife is supposed to be modeled after the relationship between Christ and his church. And she points out the fact that Jesus is the head of the church, and yet at the same time, he must submit himself to God the father. Kathy Keller in The Meeting of Marriage says this, quote, let me emphasize that Jesus' willing acceptance of this role was wholly voluntary, a gift to his father. 
I discovered here that my submission in marriage was a gift I offered to God and not a duty coerced from me. So you see, there are examples out there of godly women who want to submit to the scriptures, who care about pleasing God more than pleasing themselves, and who don't want to rule it over their husbands in a way that is negative. Kathy Keller also says later on in the book, quote, If men and women are equal in dignity but different, why is the husband the head? I think the truest answer is that we simply don't know. Why was Jesus the son, the one who submitted and served? Why wasn't it the father? We don't know, but we do know that it was a sign of his greatness and not of his weakness. See, we need to remember that whenever we humble ourselves before God, then he will lift us up in due time. He is going to take care of all these things. We don't need to worry about who's at the top, and we don't need to worry about who gets to make all the decisions or anything like that. And we don't need to worry about that in a secular relationship, in the workplace. We don't need to worry about that anywhere, and certainly not in the home life and in the family. One of the passages of the Bible that talks a lot about the relationship between the husband and the wife and connects that with Jesus and the church is in Ephesians chapter 5. And I would encourage you on your own time to read uh, all of Ephesians chapter 5, especially starting in verse 21 and going through the end of the chapter where it talks about that. And so it, it starts that section, though, by saying, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. So what that means there is that That passage is careful to clarify the fact that all of us first, before considering our relationship with other human beings, need to submit ourselves with fear to God. We need to look to God as the the ultimate God of our life and the number one in our life. And with that, we need to be willing to submit to whatever it is that he wants more than anything. So we look again at verse 1 of chapter 3. It says again, Wives, likewise be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives. Something that's different about Ephesians 5 versus this passage, we can see very clearly here in verse 1. Ephesians 5 is talking to two people who are married, who are Christians, and who want to please God. But what's different here is we have a situation where a wife might be married to somebody who's not a believer. And so we can see that as it says that some do not obey the word. So you see, that's describing the husbands there, talking about a husband who is not obedient to God, who likes to carve out his own path, who likes to do things his own way, and he is not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this, is again, is a situation where the wife is married to someone who is not saved. Now, one of the questions that comes up about that is why is she married to someone who's not saved? Because the Bible tells us clearly that the Christian is not supposed to marry the non-Christian. We are not supposed to be unequally yoked in that way. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 talks about that. Uh, But... Um, uh, whenever we consider this situation, we need to remember that this is taking place, this was written, 1 Peter was, in a time very early in Christian history. And it is very much possible that there there were people who were married to somebody and both of them were not saved. And then one of them heard the gospel and believed and became saved, but the other one didn't. And so the question is, When that happens and you find yourself married to someone who's not a Christian, what do you do? How do you relate to that person? Well, Peter's instruction here is to be submissive to their husbands. It says, even if some don't obey the word, uh, be submissive to those those husbands. Now, why why does he say that? Well, he says that because what is number one in the life of the Christian is our testimony. How is it that we have a testimony for God? It says at the end of verse 1 that they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. Now, some Bibles say uh, conversation there at the end of verse 1 in the King James. That word is an Old English word that just means conduct, how you live, the way you live your life. And so it is talking about how the wife has the ability, the privilege, you see, to live in such a way that she can be so godly, that she can be so pleasing to Jesus that her husband will see a difference in her that her husband will see how she has such a humble attitude, how her husband will see how she has such a gracious, loving attitude. And when he sees that, he is supposed to be moved by that, and she can then draw him towards the Savior. And then he will have more and more uh, of a soft heart, hopefully, and be willing to listen to the gospel. And Lord willing, with prayer and supplication, he might come to the Lord. The wife has the privilege in this situation, apparently, of preaching a wordless sermon to her spouse with her very attitudes. Verse 2 says, notice how it says, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. 
So Peter's saying that the attitude that the wife is supposed to have towards her husband is that of, of being holy and of being good and being, serving the Lord in a way that, again, uh, would be according to his word. She needs to be respectful towards him, and then there can be lots of fruit that is a result of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 talks a lot about the marriage relationship and how we are to relate to each other. And it also gives the scenario of somebody who is married to a non-Christian um, when they themselves are a Christian. And there in chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, it is talking about how they are not supposed to get a divorce simply for that reason alone. That passage is saying that uh, whenever, you, whenever you're in that situation, uh, don't think that you have to leave your spouse because of that. But if you stay in the marriage and if you stay in one household, then you can have a good sanctifying influence on that household. That's what is talked about there. You can read that on your own. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 talk about that. Now, this does not mean that whenever you have one person in the house that becomes a Christian, that all the others become a Christian and they go to heaven too. That's not necessarily how it works. They can become a Christian <laughs> if they believe in the gospel just the same way as that one person has, but they are not automatically saved just by means of that Christian influence. But that is indeed in place if you have someone who's saved in the house where there is that uh, sanctifying influence on the home that would not be there otherwise. There is a testimony that you can have to your family, even if um, they don't go to church with you, even if they don't read your Bible, their Bibles just like um, you do. You can continue to do that out of obedience to the Lord and have a good testimony for them. So we need to consider what this is talking about. It is talking about the wife's character. It is talking about her attitudes towards things. It is talking about her heart. So what kinds of things... Do we give to our heart on a regular basis? That's something we need to all ask. Verse 3. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. So here we're told that uh, the women are supposed to not let their, their beauty be merely on the outside. So some people have misunderstood these verses. Obviously, they've taken them the wrong way on one side or the other. Some people look at this as, oh, well, you're not supposed to wear jewelry. Don't put on makeup and don't do any of that stuff and just kind of uh, be all natural when you go out and, uh, you know, whatever God gave you, that's what you present and, and don't, don't use all of that stuff and because it's you pointing to yourself. Uh, but other people have misunderstood it in the other way where they, they have ignored this and where they do let their beauty, they're making their beauty to be only what is on the outside. And so the point to this is that w women need to be careful that they have a beauty. It's okay to have beauty on the outside, yes, to dress yourself up and to even use makeup, that's okay. But we want to be careful that that is not all the beauty that there is. We need to be careful that we have a character that is after God. We need to be careful that we um, are seeking after what God wants in our lives. We need to be careful that we don't have what is most important missing in that inner beauty that comes with a changed heart before God. It talks about how this is an incorruptible uh, beauty. It is a gentle and quiet spirit, and it is precious in the sight of God, and so this is what we need to be careful to put into practice. J. Vernon McGee tells the story of a woman who brought her husband to church every Sunday, and she had somewhat of a dominant personality. You know, she, was, she, was, she would drag him to church with her. You know, she was a Christian and he wasn't. And there was a long time that went by where he would not accept Christ, and she was desperate for this. She would bring him to church, and she wanted him to become saved, but he was not coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And so every Monday, whenever they would sit down for a meal together, she would weep over this. They would be together, husband and wife, and she would be crying and telling him, why won't you just believe in Jesus and be saved? Now, think, first of all, for what that would be like if, you know, as a husband, you're sitting down with a woman who's just bawling every single Monday, and, you know, it's like uncomfortable. It's like, what do you do? You know, it's like, almost like you're being pressured. But she went to J. Vernon McGee, and she, she said to him, I need some help. What should I do in order to help my husband who's not saved? And he suggested to her that you take a year off from telling him about Jesus and, and simply live the way God wants you to live. And she said, well, wait a minute. Are you telling me that I'm not supposed to witness to my husband? And he said, well, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. He was just simply talking about how she could preach that wordless sermon to him. 
And it just so happened in that case that she took some time off from talking to him about the Lord. And six months later, that man got saved. He believed in Jesus. He became born again. He was never again uh, the same. Whenever I look at this passage, I love these verses where it talks about how there can be a beauty that is not just on the outside, but a beauty that is on the inside. And I've often said that whenever I was uh, first dating my wife, I was thinking about this passage whenever I would think about her. And I told her and her mother that whenever I was uh, studying the Bible and I was thinking about our relationship, I felt that my, wa- that my now wife had, had this uh, kind of attitude that is talked about in verse 4 with this uh, beauty that is on the inside. And so we need, I, I, was, I was happy about that. I wanted to commend her for that. And, and, um, and, and so that was something that was, that was good. Men everywhere want women who, is, who are out, out, outgoing. They want women who are super exciting. They want women who are, are, are physically attractive. And that is all that they think about. They don't think about what is on the inside. And that is uh, one of the reasons, again, why there are so many problems in marriages today. A wise person once told me, Beauty fades, but character lasts. And that is very true. You want to think about the kind of person that you're thinking about getting married to and ask yourself, what is their character like? Do they have a beauty that no one can see with their eyes? Continuing in verse 5, it says, For this manner in former times, holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. I want you to notice a few words that are in uh, verse 5. It says, holy women there. And it says that they trusted in God there. And, but then it says that they were submissive to their own husbands. You see the connection there? We're being told that it's God's will for, for a godly wife to submit to her husband in a way that is healthy and in a way that is balanced and in a way that is good. And so we have an example here of, of, of women from times past, such as Sarah, who, who obeyed her husband and how she was a godly woman. And even though there were many, many problems in their marriage, right? Those of you who know the story of Abraham and Sarah. There were many problems in their marriage, but uh, they, they can be looked at still as an example of people who had faith in God and who wanted to try their best to do what they could uh, to make their relationships work. Now, I believe one of the problems, guys, is that many women struggle with this because they have a husband that is not spiritual. It is very hard for women, for women to get along with husbands and to submit to husbands that are, that are not spiritual. There are men out there who are very selfish. There are men out there who are short-tempered. There are men out there who can't be relied on to have any kind of a spiritual conversation. And that is so sad. Uh, guys, we need to look at this. We need to be the kind of husbands that our wives would be glad to respect and follow. And guys, whenever you're looking at your wives, if they have the attitude that is an inside beauty that is of the heart that comes from a born again uh, relationship with God, if we have a wife that has that kind of godly attitude, then let me tell you, that's a good woman to come home to. So we see this example of Abraham and Sarah, and they were good examples that we should follow after. Now, when we're looking at this in the context, it is, again, is speaking to people who are going through all kinds of hardship in their life, and they're going through all kinds of trouble, but it saves us a lot of trouble whenever we listen to God in the long run. Even if things are difficult, even if things don't seem to make sense to us for the, for the moment, we need to look at what he is telling us and be careful Uh, to apply it to our lives and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to do so. So as a question, what is God calling you to do today? And whatever that is, whatever conclusion you're coming to, if the Lord is, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, you want to obey him and you want to follow him. I want to conclude with seven roles for a happy marriage. Seven roles for a happy marriage. Number one, never both be angry at the same time. Number two, never yell at each other unless the house is on fire. Number three, it takes two to make an argument. One who is wrong and one person who does all the talking. Number four, strive to please your spouse over yourself. Number five, if you feel you must criticize, do so lovingly. Number six, never let the day end without saying at least one complimentary thing to your spouse. And number seven, when you've made a mistake, talk it out and ask for forgiveness. Now, as we looked at this for the with the instruction to the wives next, next week, Lord willing, as I said, we're going to look at instruction for the husbands. Let's pray. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for this difficult passage of your word, and I thank you for how you do want to give us help in our lives as we are going through this troublesome world and things are difficult. And I, so I do ask that you would help us as we go about our, our business this week, as we have this holiday, and then after the holiday, that whatever it is we're doing, that we would have help from your word and being able to live our life. And, and I thank you for your guidance and for the fact that you don't just leave us on our own to figure things out uh, by trial and error. I, I'm thankful that you give us uh, just what we need uh, in your word and that it is sufficient. So I just pray for help in these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.